from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Ahead today, a conversation with the presenter of the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture last evening at K-State, that series named in honor of the renowned and pioneering Southwest Kansas cattle producer. We'll talk with the livestock air quality specialist out of the University of California, Davis, Frank Mitlerner about his two decades of research on emissions from livestock production facilities and how to mitigate them to the benefit of producers as well as the environment. And later on this week's edition of Milk Lines, K-State's Mike Brook promotes one approach to keeping dairy calves warm and healthy during the colder fall and winter weather. That's what's ahead on this Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to the K-State Radio Network, and welcome once more to another Agriculture Today. Each year, the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University welcomes in an individual to present the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture. And this series is designed to allow for dialogue on a number of things pertaining to the agricultural industry and The individual who's been brought in to share this year's lecture is from the University of California at Davis, where he holds a rather unique capacity there as an extension specialist in air quality in that university's animal sciences department. It's our pleasure to visit now with Frank Mitlerner. Frank, welcome to K-State, first of all. Thank you very much. Your pedigree sparks interest. You might explain what an air quality specialist is doing in the livestock research sector. Well, agriculture has impacts on air quality, and uh, people might think of odors and dust, maybe even flies. But most recently, uh, a lot of the discussion has been around how livestock impacts our climate. And uh, the area around there would be studying greenhouse gases such as methane. And yes, I'm an expert in uh, quantifying those pollutants and mitigating those and uh, teaching farmers what they need to know about these air pollutants as well as how to limit them to the largest extent possible. We want to visit about your outreach in this area. A bit on your background. You've been working in this area for more than a few years, correct? Oh, yes. Uh, I did a uh, mass in agricultural engineering in Germany, where I'm from and a PhD in animal science uh, from Texas Tech University, where I specialized in the environmental management of livestock, particularly cattle. I started my faculty position as professor and air quality specialist at UC Davis in 2002. So I've been there ever since. Uh, They didn't let me go, so I'll probably stay there for a while longer. Well, 2002, you were on the frontier edge of this area, were you not, or, or were you? I think I am the only faculty member in the country who has a position of the kind that I'm holding uh, with an animal science background, but also a background in the atmospheric impacts of livestock and poultry, uh, as well as feed. And so this topic has become so large and looming that it's almost overwhelming as to how much work there is. There is really no question that this is an area of uh, growth, Uh, The area within sustainability research overall includes air and water and climate, but is not limited to it. Sustainability also includes animal welfare and worker issues and food safety and financial viability. So while all of this is part of sustainability research, I'm really more focused on the environmental and the welfare portion. Well, since you started, well, almost 20 years ago in this field, you might talk about the evolution of the science here, what the interests were back then and how they have expanded to present day. Well, when I graduated uh, in the year 2000, my colleagues there in West Texas uh, talked about me, and I I overheard one discussion where they said, oh, I like this Frank guy. He has a funny accent, but I like him. (laughs) But I wish he wouldn't use that S word all the time. And so I didn't eavesdrop, but he was loud enough for me to hear it. And so I asked him, what's the S word? Sustainability, presumably. Exactly, (laughs) sustainability. And so they didn't want me to talk about sustainability. That was 20 plus years ago. 
Now, today, the same people who said that at the time are organizing major sustainability conferences as part of the Houston Rodeo and so on. So the views have changed. And I keep telling people, would you say that as a farmer or rancher, you are the best steward that you can be? And they all say, of course. And I said, so you don't have a problem with the word stewardship? And they said, no, no, not at all. I mean, who doesn't want to be the best steward of the land that they operate or the animals that they have custody over or the products that they produce being safe or the people who work for them or the finances? All of that is part of stewardship. So while in rural America we called it stewardship all these decades, in the urban environment they call it sustainability. Okay, It's pretty much the same thing, but – different groups of the population looking at that elephant from different angles. If you want to communicate with the public, and largely that is an urban public, then you need to use language they understand. So and that's what I'm here to tell you, and that's what I'm doing. So to me, it's not just really important to do research and to teach, because that's what I do a lot of, but also to extend our knowledge. And that is uh, part of my extension appointment. And part of your duties, not a small part, is overseeing what's called the CLEAR Center. That's an acronym standing for what? Cl clarity and leadership and environmental awareness and research. CLEAR. I established the CLEAR Center at UC Davis one and a half years ago. The reason for that was that I felt that we are underserving the public and underserving people in agriculture, but also the public at large, really, in – producing fact-based information along sustainability on the one hand, so that's the research, and then, last not least, communicating it in a fact-based way. So the Clear Center has two cores. One is on research and the other one is on communications. On the research side, we have postdocs, graduate students, and so on. On the communication side, I have hired journalists to work in my center, probably one of the very few faculty members in this country who are not in journalism, who are not in communication science, but uh, who are in the agricultural sciences, who have hired journalists because of our understanding how, how important it is to do a much better job communicating agriculture to those people who want to know more about it. Interesting approach to this, but it, it's addressing that vital component that you've hinted at a couple of times. Communication has been gray in a lot of this, maybe not as clear as all parties would like. I would call it gray to black. Okay. People in agriculture are one thing which are really good at what they do, growing food, whether that's plants or animals, but we are not good communicators. Overall, okay, of course there are exceptions, but overall the agricultural sector has not done a good job communicating. And as a result, people critical of modern agriculture have stepped out and used the megaphone, sometimes the microphone, to critique agriculture and practices as to how we grow food today. And to my dismay, I haven't really seen the agricultural side doing its share in doing a better job. Overall, I think the entire industry has to think about not just how to grow food and how to do it in the most sustainable way, but also how to explain how we do things and, and also acknowledging that certain areas can be done better. And one understands the frustration of agricultural producers when they hear accusations against their industry and, and the impacts on climate change. But do you think that there are methods of communicating, exchanging information better than what we're attempting now? Well, there's no question about that. Uh, in the past, uh, the agricultural sector, by and large, has not engaged with the public at the level that, that is needed. Uh, we have to understand that a growing number, particularly of younger consumers in their 20s, has a real interest into what, where their food comes from, how it's produced, how it should not be wasted, externalities around food production, meaning how does food production affect the environment, our climate in particular. And all too often in the past, people just shied away from this discussion and said, leave me alone. You know, I don't believe my cows have anything to do with a changing climate. When indeed we know that agricultural production does impact the climate. Not just is it affected by climate, obviously, 
But agriculture also releases gases, such as greenhouse gases, that if not managed properly, can contribute to a changing climate. And we know so much more today than we did 10 years ago. Throughout that time, we have quantified the impact of the dairy, the beef sector, the poultry sector, the swine sector, the feed sector. We know how much and what kind of greenhouse gases these different sectors produce today. And all this research information is peer-reviewed and published. So we know where we are today. And we also know what steps we can take to further reduce these impacts. And here is something that gets me very excited. Because the type of gases that agriculture produces, for example, methane, can really lead to a significant reduction of warming if managed well. For example, methane, if you reduce methane, has a cooling effect, much like the planting of trees. If you were to plant forests, then forests suck carbon out of the air during photosynthesis, and that reduces warming. If you reduce methane, for example, through feeding feed additives or by covering a lagoon and trapping the biogas, if you reduce methane, then you're pulling carbon out of the air. You can generate credits, and these credits can be bought by other sectors, and you can get paid for it. And if you don't believe me, then come to California and take a good look as to what our dairy industry is doing right now, reducing massive amounts of methane and selling the credits off to sectors that need them, like the fossil fuel sector making a very significant additional income possible. Frank, we need to take a quick break. want to come back to some of these boots-on-the-ground applications of what you're talking about, if we might, in just a second, and reflect back on your presentation last night at the Gardner Lecture. He is Frank Mitlerner from the University of California at Davis. We'll be back with him after this break. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today and featuring during today's broadcast, the presenter of the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture last evening here on the Kansas State University campus. Once more, he is an extension air quality specialist in the animal science department at the University of California at Davis, Frank Mitlerner. Frank, just before we had to take a few moments aside, you were talking of some of the ways of implementing Good stewardship in, for example, methane management out of our livestock operations. You mentioned that we do know about those emissions more clearly than we did 20 years ago. What is the truth as we would go down the species, pork, beef, poultry, and so forth? So pork and poultry largely produce methane via decomposing manure. Okay? When that manure decomposes, methane is produced if that manure is stored under oxygen-deprived conditions in so-called anaerobic lagoons. Okay? Then they produce methane. Pigs and poultry are not the focus of the greenhouse gas discussion, though ruminant animals are. Why? Because ruminant animals such as cattle or goats or sheep can digest, feed, nobody else can, for example, cellulose-rich grasses. And when these microbes in that very large stomach of these ruminants, when these microbes digest these nutrients, they produce methane gas. And that methane gas is belched out. This process is called enteric fermentation and resulting are enteric emissions, and that's methane. That's the number one source of methane from agriculture. The number two source is animal manure. So now how can we address that? Either enteric emissions, belched out, or manure emissions from the, from the animal manure. Well, on the enteric side, we've done dozens of studies at UC Davis where we looked at different feed additives you can feed to ruminant livestock. And we found that of the 35 products that are out there, 30 don't do a thing and 5 do. They reduce not just enteric methane, but they also improve the performance of animals, whether it's dairy cows or whether it's beef animals. So there's really hope that we can markedly change the amount of methane belched out, and that's in the best interest of not just the public, but also the farmers, because losing methane is a net loss to performance, and therefore to the pocketbook of the farmer, because 
losing methane is a loss of energy. If we can reduce that, then more energy goes into performance. So several of the feed additives we have looked at uh, reduce enteric emissions by anywhere between 10 to 50 percent, 5-0. What I have studied as well are emission reductions from animal manure. Just as a little backdrop here, in California, uh, that might not surprise your listeners, we have the first methane law in the nation called SB 1383, which mandates a 40, 40, 40% methane reduction to be achieved in 10 years from now, by the year 2030. That's an aggressive policy. That is huge. And... When the legislature came out with this, our farmers were up in arms, thinking never can we live up to a 40% reduction of methane. What they didn't know at the time was that the state had something smart up their sleeves, which was not to use the normal cane approach of using rules and regulations and fines to achieve a certain outcome, but instead they used the carrot approach, financially incentivizing a reduction of methane. The state of California took half a billion dollars and partnered with the dairy and other sectors to reduce methane gas from animal manure. As a result, dozens of dairies went ahead and they covered their lagoons where the manure was stored. They covered the lagoons and now the gases that normally would go into the air, referred to as biogas, by the way, 60, 60% of biogas is methane, that biogas now no longer goes into the air, but is trapped under the top. And then the biogas is taken and converted into a fuel type. And this fuel type is used for vehicle fleets, such as semi-trucks. The fuel type is called RNG, renewable natural gas. So the dairies capture the biogas. The biogas is then sold off, converted into renewable natural gas, a fuel type. And that fuel is going into vehicle fleets, to replace diesel in semi-trucks with this RNG. This conversion of biogas to RNG is the most carbon-negative fuel type there is, meaning you are net reducing carbon emissions, and that is very strongly incentivized financially by the state with what's called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Credits. Low Carbon Fuel Standard Credits. That's a mouthful, (laughs) but a mouthful to remember, because these credits run so high that there are dairymen reporting to me that they're making more money of their low-carbon fuel standard credits than they do of their milk check. So this seems to be a method that is attractive to producers. We've had dozens going this route, and cumulatively our dairy sector over the last three years achieved a 25% reduction of methane. I told you the goal is 40. They're over halfway there. The technology is clearly there then. It's a matter of incentivization, broadly more so than we see today in our general ag economy. Well, if you were a dairy farmer in Kansas today and you were to do what I just said, which is cover your lagoon, you could take that biogas credit and sell it to the California market and you would get the same, the same money as a California farmer would. So in my opinion, this model... This California model for once worked. (laughs) It seems to be financially viable and it seems to do the job on the methane side. I don't see anybody having a problem with it except for some activists who view the success of it as a problem because they feel that if more people were to use such technology, that would drive us to even larger dairies. Okay, That's what they say, but that's not really happening. I think that within the next five years, half of our dairies in the state will have these covered lagoons. And I think that in 10, 15 years uh, from now, uh, the entire industry in this country will look into this type of technology. Is this applicable for other species, such as cattle production, obviously dominant here in the state of Kansas? Uh, It's not possible for feedlots, for beef cattle feedlots. Because there the manure is, you know, solid and scraped out of the corrals. A lot of what you scrape out of the corrals has inorganic material, sand and so on in it. And that's not conducive for anaerobic digestion, okay? But 
this type of technology would work for poultry and pigs and dairy cows, for all those systems that have either very little inorganic material in it or none, uh, and or have liquid manure storage. And uh, so it would definitely work for pigs and it would work for poultry as well. Is there a solution on the cattle feedlot side that you perceive? I would say that on the feedlot side, the best solution is through enteric emission reductions, meaning feed additives. Uh, here I have uh, done research on additives that reduced anywhere between 10 to 30 percent of enteric methane. On the manure side, you can scrape that manure out of the corrals, add some carbon-containing material straw or so to it, and compost it. And if you figure out a cost-effective way of applying that compost to grazing lands, then that addition of compost to grazing lands, you pretty much spread it thinly, will have a very significant impact on soil carbon sequestration. Soil carbon sequestration is the process by which soils store carbon from the air. Soils store about a third of all carbon from human activity. Soils are actually very important to us, and by incorporating composted feedlot manure onto rangelands, we can uh, amplify that. But the question really is, can we do this in a cost-effective way? And that I don't know yet. But the momentum may be heading in that direction. The interest is there, you believe. Oh, there's no doubt about the interest. The question is not, is there interest or is there incentive, but how fast is the industry willing to pursue something like this? And how willing are they to say, okay, there's a topic that's of major importance to society. We are part of it. We have quantified it. We know what our contributions are. And now we want to be more of a solution than a liability. Once you first gain the trust of the agricultural producer and then the confidence by showing them that what you do is not just some ivory tower idea but something that works in the real world, uh, then you can move the needle. And I think we've done that. Appreciated your presentation last evening. Appreciate your time with us right here today. Thank you so much for passing all of this along. It's good to have you here at Kansas State University. Thank you very much for having me. Once again, he is from the University of California at Davis, an extension air quality specialist in its animal sciences department. Frank Mitlerner. Frank was the presenter of the Henry C. Gardner Global Food Systems Lecture last evening here on the campus. And his topic was Rethinking Methane, Animal Agriculture's Path to Climate Neutrality. You're listening to Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. And now our regular Tuesday feature for you dairy producers out of the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State. On this week's edition of Milk Lines, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook has a timely word considering our change in the weather of late. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning what we can do to keep our calves a little warmer as we head into the fall and winter months. You know, one of the things that we can really do to help our newborn calves on our dairy farms is to actually put a blanket on them. I know many of you use these, but as I travel and visit farms, I see a lot of farms that do not. And it's one of those things that we probably should invest in because it has a huge impact on the health of these younger calves. When you think about newborn calves, their thermal neutral zone is between 50 and 78 degrees Fahrenheit which is actually fairly warm when you think about it. So when you, we think about our wintertime temperatures, we're often well below that. So if you haven't looked into the calf blankets, it's really something you should look into. You know, for those animals that are less than three weeks of age, using the blanket when the temperature is below 40 degrees Fahrenheit could be a very important item in increasing their health and also increasing their growth rate. One of the rules they use a little north of us is that if the ground is frozen, make sure you use calf blankets for the first three weeks of life. 
that could be a good rule for us. But when you think about uh, the temperatures that we have here and the fact that they tend to go up and down quite a bit, we may have to modify that just a little bit. We can have some pretty cool nights in which calves will become stressed if they're not adequately protected. Their first form of protection is a really good straw bed, something that they can nest in and get about 60% of their body in contact with the straw. In addition to that, when it's colder, providing blankets for the first three weeks of life would be an effective way to keep them warm. A couple of cautions when using these. Number one, make sure that you do launder these and clean them in between calves. That would be very important. And secondly, during the day, if it gets very warm, you may have to remove the blanket. We do not want the calf to sweat while wearing the blanket during warmer afternoon temperatures. So it might be a situation where we do have to remove those during the day and then put them back on in the evening. If you haven't considered calf blankets for your dairies, I guess I would encourage you to try a few of those just to see how you feel that they actually work in your own situation. Again, when the temperatures are below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, something we should probably consider to keep our calves more comfortable and healthy. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. All right, Mike, many thanks, as always. And this note of interest before we sign off today, K-State's Animal Sciences and Industry Department is again hosting at each home football game, tailgates for any family and friends of the department. That is at a new location this year, the Stanley Stout Center, which, if you don't know, is to the north and the east of the stadium complex. The tailgate starts three hours before kickoff in the case of this Saturday, and the game versus Iowa State, that would be around 3.30. The menu off the grill, burgers, brats, as well as chips, soft drinks, or water. And the Animal Sciences and Industry Student Clubs will be parking cars as a fundraiser at three locations, aligned with the tailgate, the Stanley Stout Center entrance, the Sheep and Meat Goat Center, or the KSU Foundation lot. And there will be a shuttle operating from the Stanley Stout Center entrance to the west end of the KSU Foundation lot before kickoff to cut down on the walking distance there. So if you've been a patron of the Animal Sciences and Industry tailgate in the past or would like to try it out this Saturday, as well as for the remaining home games throughout the schedule, look into that. There are more details, including the parking specifics, at asi.ksu.edu. That is our time for today. On tomorrow's broadcast, we plan to visit with K-State's Walt Fick. You'll have the latest recommendations on chemical treatments against woody brush in pastures here in the fall. That tomorrow, meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.